Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Cryptids and Monsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do the next part, part 4 of chapter 1 of the Occult Investigator, Real Cases from the Files of X Investigations by Bob Johnson. Thank you so much everyone for your continued comments on this series. It looks like people are liking it, and I'm definitely having some fun sharing this type of of great stuff here so without further ado let's go ahead and let's share this chapter four and then see what happens next i'm sorry part four of what happens next within the curse of the velvet room cafe so here's where i left off part four with that remark x investigations experienced its first paranormal anomaly it was at that point we heard a rapid tapping sound. At first we thought the sound came from frozen rain pellets beating against Mary's living room window, but as she turned her head into the bedroom, we realized the sound was coming from within the room. There, see it's happening, she said with a much more agitated voice. There's that infernal rapping on the painting above my bed. It happens almost every evening and it's driving me mad. I asked if Savannah and I could enter the room and Mary told us to go right ahead but to be very careful. Sometimes things fly across the room, she warned. And so when we entered to the double doors, we first noticed the coldness of the room and thought that the heat was turned off. The sensation reminded me of my Salem ghost experience. I could literally see Savannah's breath mist in the dim light. Yes, it was cold in New York, but luxury digs are kept warm for sure. And the living area was very comfortable. Something out of the ordinary was happening in Mary's room. But before we could identify what caused the tapping sounds in the room, we heard a large, a loud shout from the living room we had left Mary sitting. A scream of, get the F out, you effing whore masters, echoed throughout the apartment, apparently coming from where Mary was seated. And so we rushed into the living room and saw her slumped in her chair, mouth agape, and then staring off into space. We were sure it was her making the sounds because we were in the room in an instant, and there was no way anyone else could have entered. Her flesh was cold to the touch, and a thin stream of saliva slid down her chin. We called her name, but she continued to stare, so we shook her shoulders until we were able to rouse some consciousness in her. The living room was now as cold as the bedroom, and the steam from all of our breathing was evident in the air. The parlor was filled with panic and an eerie sensation that both Savannah and I let her agreed was like nothing we had ever experienced. It was dreadful and lonely. It was like the feeling you get if you're left alone at a wake. The only person in the room with that body, that's at least what Silvana said. Mary, Mary, what's wrong? What happened? I asked as before, uh, before as Silvana rubbed Mary's hands and wrists to help her revive. Mary could barely speak, but she told us that something had taken control of her and she could not be responsible for her actions. After a few minutes, she told us that since that day in the cafe, Nothing had been the same. She felt as though she was cursed by a malevolent force that somehow entered her in the Velvet Room Cafe in the middle of an afternoon on an autumn day in Manhattan. Mary recounted how she went back to the cafe after the first episode in an effort to ease her mind and prove to herself that the panic attack she first experienced there was nothing more than a physical reaction to the earlier choking trauma. But only after a few moments at the shop's counter, strange things began again. This time, the brass antique espresso machine behind the counter erupted, spurting hot coffee in the face of the waitress and splashing onto Mary's arm, nearly scalding her. Mary ran screaming from the cafe onto the street, sobbing hysterically as she hurried home. But that's not all, she continued. The bad things got worse. I returned to the cafe for the third time and sat there for about 10 minutes despite the shopkeeper, Mr. Langley's apprehension about me possibly causing another scene. My stay was fine for a short while. That was until my order was served. I asked for an orange muffin and hot chocolate with whipped cream, a dish that I've been fond of since I was a child. It always makes me feel secure, conjuring memories of my happy childhood. That was until the waitress placed my order on the table in front of me. I thought I was hallucinating because I saw the muffin jump, at least move a little bit. When I lifted it, there were literally hundreds of crawling, black, multi-legged, silverfish insects stuck to the bottom of the muffin and squirming on the plate. 
I was transfixed by the horrible sight, not believing my eyes. My first impulse was to call for the waitress and complain, but I couldn't move. I was virtually paralyzed by the sickening creatures darting in and out of the muffin and jumping into my hot chocolate. With that last statement, Mary began to sob uncontrollably. I need help. Something not of this world is cursing my life. Please, whatever you can do to free me, I will appreciate. I've heard of poltergeists and possessions. I know I'm sane in every way, but no one takes me seriously. I turn to you to deal with what I believe is the unseen. On our way back to our respective apartments and crowded in another damp, cold cab, Sylvan and I agreed that Mary was as sane as she claimed and she was very possibly the victim of a malevolent force. It is common knowledge among those who study human nature as it applies to curses and possessions that if one believes ever so slightly in superstitions of any kind, their susceptibility to superstitious suggestion is always present. It was our job to discover whether Mary was somehow contacted by someone, exposed to something that set this curse mode in motion in her life, or if in fact was truly cursed. It was X Investigations' first case, and it was a baffling one. Our first step was to visit the cafe the next day to witness the origin of Mary Montrose's haunting. And so we called Mr. Langley, the owner of the cafe, the following morning, but he said that the only time he had free was near closing, around 11 p.m. So if we wanted, we could meet him there late. Saban and I arrived just as the store clerk was about to lock the front door. Fortunately, we saw Mr. Langley and asked the clerk to tell him who we were. He greeted us with some suspicion, not understanding that we weren't detectives looking to nail him on something, but paranormal investigators simply associated with a detective agency. Once we told him that we had been hired by Mary, he nodded and said, Oh yes, the crazy lady who thinks my cafe is haunted. Langley described Mary's experiences almost exactly as Mary did herself, without Mary's description of internal terror. Something really spooked that woman. We all just thought she was nuts, but I'll admit there were bugs in her food, and that's very odd here because I keep an immaculate kitchen. It's never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. And she carried a Bible with her the last time she was here. Guess it didn't help. We thought she was odd, but it got us thinking about Jeremy's problem, Mr. Langley said. And so I asked Jeremy's problem, and he said, yeah, we had a worker here that used to close up the shop. He said he saw strange things going on. You know, he saw shadows, things being moved out of his knowledge, wispy smoke coming from the cellar door, crazy stuff like that. But it didn't happen all the time, so we just thought he was a loony, too. And oh yeah, Jeremy said it all started when he found the old docket in the cellar filled with deeds for this place from the turn of the 18th century. I was about to ask to see those old papers when Silvana grabbed my wrist tightly and whispered to me that she felt a presence in the room. I could see the sweat bead on her upper lip as she tried to control herself. She was squirming in her chair as Langley went out to about the papers, describing the original deeds and the voluminous legal documents. They might be worth some money, he asked. And so Savannah became more agitated. Her eyes were half closed and her breathing intensified so noticeably that Langley became alarmed. Hey, what's wrong with her, he asked. I told him she was a clairvoyant and that she was experiencing some kind of paranormal manifestation. She's being contacted or she's becoming part of your ghost, Mr. Langley. But during this uh, at least disturbing episode, uh, the velvet room suddenly became cold. As cold as Mary's bedroom the evening before. Now, all of our exhalations were evident as smoky wisps. Langley turned pale, as Savannah said to me in between gas, that we must leave the cafe, and she would explain when we left. At that very moment, my cell phone rang. It was Mary, and she was screaming a plea for help. She was crying that her apartment was literally seething with activity. The wall paintings were banging, drawers opening, the toilets were bubbling and backing up water, and she was in fear of her life. I told her we would be right over and asked her not to call the police. And so I rushed Silvana out of the cafe and told Langley we would be back. He stood there in a daze with a baffled and frightened look on his face. We heard him yelling as we left, is my cafe haunted? What the hell? On the ride over to Mary's, Savannah told me that there was a force, a disturbed, vengeful presence that was attempting to settle the score for itself. 
It was connected with the cafe and the old papers found in the cellar, and Mary was somehow involved. Savada warned me that the thing was at its final stages on this plane, and whatever was to transpire would happen quickly. I had only known Savannah for a few days, but I could see in her eyes that she was dead serious about whatever grasped her in the cafe. Until this point, she had been witty and often a bit sarcastic. Now she seemed truly troubled by what we were facing. We expected to see a trashed apartment when we arrived at Mary's, but we never expected to see Mary herself in such a horrific condition. Her clothes were drenched in sweat, her hair was completely disheveled, and her eyes were teary and bloodshot. The place stank, as though old gym clothes had been left in piles for days, gathering mold and mildew. Mary, too, smelled of perspiration and could barely speak when we entered the apartment. She said that this was the worst event yet. After her home had been violently tossed by the bizarre eruptions, the entity appeared. I saw terrible faces in the mirrors. They were sickly pale and looked at me with dreadful eyes. The cold stares were unbearable. I was paralyzed by the stares and I couldn't move, Mary said. Then she said that the thing actually spoke to her in full sentences. In an eerie moan that rang of despair and hatred, it demanded that she pay for the heinous heartache and damages of the whoremongers. It yelled at me. It said that I was the caretaker of sorrow and that it was the mantrasses who killed its family. It said it was a slave of the house but did not deserve to lose its loved ones because of a greedy landholder, Mary told us. And so Savannah and I were extremely troubled by what we heard, but at least now we had some clues. We left Mary's, assuring her that we would be able to help, and it occurred to me that whatever had spooked Mary, even if it was her own imagination, was evidence of a link between the cafe and Mary's family that we could use to make sense out of this case. The use of the word landholder stuck in my mind. I remember reading it used as a New York slang in the late 18th century to describe what we commonly know as landlords or real estate owners. When I mentioned this to Silvana, she suggested we check the city records to see if the building that housed the Velvet Room Cafe had any connection to Mary's family. Sure enough, at the New York City Building Department's Bureau of Records in Manhattan, we discovered that Mary's family, the Montroses, owned quite a bit of real estate on the east side of Manhattan, and from what we could discern from the old records, one of her ancestors had owned a very building plot that housed the cafe. After searching the microfish newspaper pages from that era, we discovered that the Montrose House, as it was called, originally a refuge for the destitute, became a body house or a brothel after its owner, Murdoch Montrose, evicted the shelter's operator. It was reported that the Montrose tossed the tenants, who included a caretaker, his wife, and six children onto the street. After some digging, we found some newspaper accounts about the caretaker being arrested after he assaulted Murdoch in a street brawl. Apparently, some of his children died as a result of their homelessness, and the caretaker went berserk. We also discovered that the caretaker was later released from jail and returned to the brothel, violently confronting Murdoch once again, and was ultimately shot dead by one of Murdoch's henchmen. The newspaper articles made it obvious that Murdoch's motivation was greed, just as the ghost had told Mary. It was also evident that Mary Montrose was now suffering from a curse levied on her ancestors over 200 years ago. Now we knew that when Mary entered the Velvet Room Cafe, she set that spirit off. Somehow it knew she was a blood relative and it was determined to wreak revenge. We phoned Mary immediately, told her what we uncovered about her family's involvement with that cafe, and that if we could perform a ceremony, perhaps a seance or exorcism using Silvana as a medium, we could offer some kind of help to undo the Montrose curse and release the spirit. We thought it best to conduct a seance in the cafe itself, so we called the next morning to set up an appointment to visit. Now, the cafe normally opened early to cater to the breakfast crowd, but oddly enough, no one answered when we called. When we tried three times after 10 a.m. and there was still no answer, Savannah and I decided to ride down to see Langley for ourselves. It would be better to talk to first to him directly about matters so strange, Savannah said to me in her Czech accent. 
About three blocks from the cafe, we were trapped in traffic. Not atypical for midtown Manhattan. I didn't like the look in Savannah's eyes as our cab came to a dead stop. She turned her head toward me, but before it could utter, she could utter a word, I said, let's get out and walk. And so we started down the block and we could see the problem up ahead. Fire trucks and emergency vehicles blocked the street. At first, I thought, hoped that it wasn't what I suspected, but Silvana's walk now turned into a trot, confirmed the worst. She was ahead of me yelling, Robert, the cafe, it has burned down. We managed to find Langley, seriously distraught, and called him over to us outside of the fire lines. He said that his place had mysteriously caught fire last evening and that it had been destroyed and the building would probably have to be demolished. He rambled on about his losses and his business woes and then added, And oh yeah, that crazy woman was by here this morning too. She just stared and smiled. Nuts. Later, we visited Mary and were surprised to see her in good spirits. Actually, she was better than we had ever seen her. She, of course, knew that the cafe had burned down and that she felt relieved. You both made me realize the heartache my ancestors were responsible for, and I'm truly sorry. I believe that my family's past transgressions were somewhat purged in the flames of the fire last night. The ghost was obviously happy that the place burned down, and I feel it will never bother me again. I sincerely thank you both for your compassion and help, and of course, please bill me whatever the cost. As Savannah and I turned to leave the apartment, we were happy to know at least Mary was now satisfied that the curse had been lifted. But we couldn't explain the coincidental burning of the store just when we were about to perform the exorcism and seance. We also couldn't explain the sudden calm in Mary's demeanor. Silvana, more than I, was particularly observant about Mary's attitude and was shocked to see that Mary wasn't marrying, wearing the priceless initial M diamond brooch that she wore constantly. She politely asked Mary where the brooch was, and Mary answered quite matter-of-factly, Oh, I think I may have lost it, perhaps at the cafe during one of my episodes. It was much too ostentatious anyway. It probably burned and lost in the fi- and is lost in the fire now. I won't miss it much. It's a small price to pay for peace of mind. Wouldn't you agree? And then Mary asked, smiling. Epilogue. The cause of the Red Room Cafe was never f- discovered when it came to the fire, although according to New York City Fire Department records, arson was not ruled out. Langley was not a suspect and insurance fraud was ruled out because there was no obvious motive. The business was doing well. We phoned Mary Montrose some months later and asked her if any paranormal experiences were happening or if they were truly over. She said everything was fine and her life was completely free of any odd occurrences. She mentioned she had contacted Langley about rebuilding on his burned out lot. Oddly enough, she said, each time he planned to rebuild his business on the land, something inevitably stopped the operation. It didn't surprise me, however, so we agreed to build a community center. Langley's happy with that. He told me that he would sleep nights again. Seems he was having some difficulty, Mary said. And then that's it. That's everything associated with Chapter 1 of Occult Investigator, Real Causes from the Files of Ex Investigations by Bob Johnson, and the chapter being called The Curse of the Railroad Room Cafe. So how about that? What a fascinating twist, right, when it came to this particular situation. Here you had this woman, Mary. Apparently, it turns out she was the long lost or the long descendant associated with the landlord, or as they described in a little differently back then, landowner so or landholder. So in this case, here you had her either by fate or by some kind of other destiny of some sort falling into that Velvet Room Cafe. And then once she was in there, that ghost of whoever that caretaker was was still there and they were pissed off. They were really mad about their situation. And who could blame them? Here you had a situation where uh, all those years back, they were the caretaker. They were there with their wives. They were there with their six kids. And they were kicked out by that uh, greedy landowner, Montrose. And when that happened, the uh, kids ended up dying out there on the streets. And then, of course, the caretaker was wanting to take revenge. And then as soon as they were trying to, they in turn 
ended up getting killed, shot by one of the um, goons associated with Montrose. And then when that occurred, they haunted that location ever since, looking for the right opportunity to be able to exact their revenge. It made me wonder, though, why, if, if Montrose was still alive at that time after um, the caretaker was killed, why it did not exact the revenge on Montrose during that time period, you know? Like, in other words, finding that location, doing something with it, because presumably that location would have continued existing and it would have still been having control for Mon- by Montrose, so there's a good chance that Montrose would have been there later on. I mean, obviously, he's the landlord. He would have been there at some point seeing how things were going or something else along those lines. But who knows? That's still something left up in the air. Also, the other question I have, I'm sure that y'all were thinking it as well. Did Mary do something with that fire? It seemed too much of a coincidence, right? Here you have a situation where she was being plagued by this curse caused by the by her long relative in the past and then this ghost this poltergeist or entity was doing all of these things now at her home she was at her wits end i mean the chapter clearly described that multiple times and so she finally decided to take action now i'm thinking and i'm sure you were thinking as well and i'm sure the police were thinking as well that something was happening like there was some kind of arson there's even that line in the chapter where arson was not ruled out but they could not find a specific cause and so there was nothing declared on it but the fact that mary was now free of her dilemma and the fact that that ghost was now free as well makes one wonder did mary cause the fire or did that entity cause the fire or who knows was it truly just 100 percent by accident like somebody left the gas light on or somebody Uh, did something else leaving a candle on somewhere who knows but still i'm kind of erring on the former but i'm not 100 percent sure this would be something i wish that there was more information on the fact that she had also hinted with regards to that about losing that brooch and not really caring about it calling it a small price to pay when it came to peace of mind made me wonder again how much she could have been involved with that arson but great chapter though this will be a good idea of how essentially the rest of the book will go love to hear where your comments are too below and then i'll also introduce chapter two later on all right everyone thanks again as always take care bye